Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on literature of the early 20th century, trends and influences on American literature. So this mini lecture is going to look at some of the major things of the late 19th and early 20th century that are in the world or that writers during this time are experiencing or being exposed to. And the idea is to think about these things as being factors or elements of a changing world that the writer either directly or indirectly is channeling into their writing. So the first is, of course, the impact of industrialism. And we talked about this when we talked about the, the 1800s, but in the 1900s, you know, the, the full impact of industrialism is, is hard to ignore. Um, it has changed so much of the way of life. The United States itself had gone from a largely agrarian society to a highly urban society. You see population switch. You know, for much of the history, people were living in rural environments and farms and villages and we see this switch happening you know throughout the early 20th century of mass migration to major cities and we see the rise of metropolises these ginormous cities that house millions of people who have millions of interactions day after day and these things called skyscrapers right these ginormous buildings that touch the sky much taller than anything previously imagined Right? If we're familiar with the Empire State Building, or I guess it's now the Donald Trump Building or whatever, uh, you know, that, this, is a, this, is a, this is something produced out of that time. And so we can imagine the world really transformed in some profound ways. World becomes a faster paced world. We see the rise of cars. Trains become increasingly faster. Boats become faster we see even the printed word becomes faster because while you have printing press and these other types of other types of uh, publication resources you also see the rise of the typewriter so no longer do you have just publishers being able to you know type up things but now you have individuals you have companies that don't need a printing press but can type up many things this is the time you know we we move from scriveners right people who re wrote other documents to people that are typing and so this gives rise to a whole new class of people uh, that will be you know sitting at typewriters for many hours during the day the world becomes smaller we see the introduction of airplanes and airplanes do make the world smaller you can now increasingly make it to other parts of the world in a much shorter time if you want to reach the other side of the world it becomes increasingly easy to but also it means the ways and the places that people engage in war right in world war one it is a war that takes place largely in europe and yet there are places like the united states that get involved and can be involved because it's a smaller distance today or during the well, today especially, but during the early uh, 20th century than it was 100 years previously. They can get masses of people over there much quicker. And that's because they, it's, they found, they've found more efficient ways to do that, uh, largely, largely sustained off of the introduction of petroleum oil and the, uh, the engine. But with that, we also see a lot of, you know, going from war and talking about World War One. we see a lot of modern death and destruction. We find, with all of this that goes on, we find massive ways to destroy and kill one another. Uh, we, see, You know, the, the image I have here is the atomic bomb, but of course, even before that, we see a lot more. We see high-impact deaths. We see... Uh, Genocides happened throughout the 20th, early 20th century, starting with the Armenian Genocide and the most uh, famous genocide, of course, the Holocaust. But we also see things like the Spanish Flu in the late 1910s, which wipes out 30 million people, uh, or there approximately. Uh, so we see modern death occur in, in massive ways that have previously been incapable, right? That industrialization didn't just happen to improve people's lives and give us all sorts of gadgets, but it was also an industrialization of military. You can mass produce weapons, you can mass produce cannons or uh, artillery weapons or, you know, bombs. And so we see this also start to escalate. And this will, this impacts many writers uh, when they see, or many writers go off to war and they never really leave war behind when they get to writing their, um, their stories. 
And then we also get new modes of storytelling. Uh, we see the introductions of comics in the late 19, I'm sorry, in the late 1800s, as well as film in the late 1800s, and then also we see radio. Film and comics become fairly popular fairly quickly. Uh, radio doesn't really take off until 1920s, 1930s, but all of these are different forms of storytelling that grab people's imagination, that people you know, thoroughly enjoy. And people go to those because many of these are, well, in the case of comics, they're just like other types of reading. They can bring home, they can trade, they can interact. But things like the radio or film, these are new forms of storytelling that people are experiencing and thoroughly enjoying. And so writers are in part aware of this, are influenced by this. Many authors talk about you know, what kind of previous things influence their storytelling and their writing. Um, I know Stephen, you know, Stephen King is a good example. Many authors were influenced by comics in one way, shape, or form. Many other writers have been influenced by film and kind of the, the ways in which film you know, enlightened, enlightened their imagination. In radio as well, people don't think about radio as much today, but old time radio with all its storytelling. Uh, it was constantly having all sorts of different shows that were story-based shows, whether it was a mystery theater or some kind of soap opera or some kind of sci-fi show. And so these modes go and they influence authors. They influence the pacing. They influence the ways in which things are described, uh, the ways in which things sound, the ways in which things are, you know, people or characters interact, or even just what are the articles within a particular story, or the artifacts within a particular story. And then we also get reform movements that we see, right? And we see a series of reform movements. We see workers, you know, banding together and trying to protect themselves against exploitative practices by, uh, by corporations. We see various women movements for, uh, in, a, in, in various ways to attain uh, rights around voting, right? We see rights around um, voting, around equal access to goods and materials, but we also see reform movements around alcohol, which we know most famously is prohibition, uh, and reform movements around sex and sexuality, and there's a variety of these, um, you know, reform movements against pornography that occur in the 18, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And these are all, particularly when we look at, you know, the concerns around sex and alcohol, these reform movements are very much uh, stimulated. <laughs> pun intended, stimulated by the fact that people are living closer together in much bigger and newer and dynamic uh, settings, right? The urban center, the city, the metropolis is a very, very different place. And you have people living, you have individuals living in apartments and you have women living alone or living with men that they are not married to. And so you see the rise and the concern around alcohol, sex, and drugs, particularly as, it look, as they look at the city and the opportunities for exploration that, they find, that, um, that is found to be disconcerting by the culture at large. And so much of what we see within the world of, of art and the various types of art is the shift towards the elusive. Uh, we see the rise of modern art, and this could be true of modern poetry, modern literature, which moves towards elusive, right? So if we have television, or if we have, if we have film, right, we can capture the real world, or we can tell stories with real people and props and things like that. We've talked about this in class where we see the shift now in art to become more abstract because art re realizes, well, you know, much of the his history of art has been trying to capture reality. But now that reality can be captured, modern art moves in this direction of, oh, no, 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 no. There's something more. A mere picture, a mere, a mere photograph cannot capture the essence of meaning. And so art becomes more and more abstract. You know, a good example of that is, of course, um, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, but we see many artists uh, throughout the eight, late 1800s and 1900s really try to reinvent art to be something that is not easily decoded. Um, and this, this, this alienates the common people. That is, as the common people get exposed to literature, get, you know, get exposed to reading, become literate, get exposed to a lot of different information, become more intelligent than previous, civil, previous societies, 
the, the elite art culture shifts away and says, oh, no, 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 this is, this is, this is too abstract. This is too, it's much more in-depth than just a mere replication of reality. Um, so we start to see this, and we see this within literature too. We see, you know, a moving away from from certain types of storytelling to very oftentimes, you know, challenging forms in that the story is in a clear direction. Uh, stream of consciousness is a, is often a good example of uh, modern literature that can start to alienate people. That is, you move from a story that has, you know, that, that has its various techniques, but then you start to move away, various techniques um, that are used across the board, and then you move into things like stream of consciousness, where there's almost an intention to confuse the lay listener. All right, so finally, we have the 20th century as an age of new thinkers. Um, and I shouldn't say new thinkers, it's just we have these these people, these big names in many different fields of thought and, uh, and study that start to change the game and start to make us think profoundly different than what we thought of before in terms of culture. And so I'm just going to list a couple of them here and just kind of, you know, feel free to go off and take a look at them. But people like Einstein, Bakhtin, Gramsci, Heidegger, Jung, Keynes, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, these are philosophers, these are uh, physicists, these are uh, psychologists, these are social theorists. Um, you know, when you look at, at Marx, uh, when you look at Marx or you look at Keynes, you're looking at economists or people who are re-understanding how we work at, in terms of economies. But all of them are coming up with these very profound ideas that are then influencing how society moves forward or what society tries to do or doesn't try to do. And then all of this results in a bigger, more robust literary divergence. So we start to see the we start to see new voices emerge within the literary canon and conscious movements for uh, different groups that had been previously alienated. So the Harlem Renaissance is a collection of African American writers and other uh, subordinate groups who come together and start to try to profoundly capture their experiences and write and deliver style, deliver in a style and in in elements that are relevant to their identity and the experience of being African American in American culture. As I mentioned before, we see the rise of, of stories that are stream of consciousness. Um, this is an attempt to get at kind of what it really is like to live a story or to experience the inner mind, right? And stream of consciousness is this is often writing that's attempting to capture exactly what our train of thought is, because as we think, we never think in a straight line. You know, we may be thinking about something, but then there's other thoughts that pop up and direct us or redirect us. And there are certainly plenty of examples of that that are out there worth uh, exploring. And we see a very, we, we continue to see the genre literature emergence. We start to see more horror or horror become its own genre. Now, there have been scary stories before, but we start to get a canon of the important works of horror, right? We have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We have Dracula. We have Frankenstein. We have the works of H.P. Lovecraft and Ambrose Bierce. We see the rise of science fiction with authors like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, and then we move into the American, you know, we, we move later on and we start to see other writers, um, particularly during the age of Pulp Fiction, that really contribute to science fiction. We see the rise of mystery. Now, there had been mystery stories prior to this, but we start to see the rise of the detective. This was first made popular, or the most famous, you know, the first incarnation of this is from Edgar Allan Poe, and after Edgar Allan Poe, we see, you know, two other big writers Agatha Christie and, of course, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle develop detective, reoccurring detective characters, and we see mystery as a genre take off. Uh, and we start to see romance, and romance, again, is, is a, uh, as we talked about censorship, you know, romance is this way of, of trying to, you know, tell stories that have, that hint at or tell or tease about the sexual relationship or the potential sexual relationship between two people. All right, so those are the, the major things uh, to be thinking about as we look at literature in the late 
uh, 1800s, early 1900s, and to kind of think about these things or just spot when they're at play in different stories. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you in the next lecture.